<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cup Reviews, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your host, marketing manager, Mackenzie, and tonight we are doing a very fun, hilarious Laughville production of Present Laughter by Noel Coward. This was directed by, apologies in advance, Moritz von Stupinel, Stup Stupinel, apologies. Uh, and this was a Tony nominated uh, 2017 Broadway revival production that we are watching that stars the great, wonderful Kevin Klein. That's right, the guy who voiced Captain Phoebus in Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Among playing, many other things. Among many other things. <laughs> is playing the titular, or not titular, lead character of Gary uh, Essadine. So there we go. And to joining me tonight, we have a fantastic group of panelists. First off, uh, we have the wonderful Talia Rivers. Hello, Talia. Hello. So excited to be here. Yes. Welcome aboard. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's in your cup as you are a new face to the panel? I am indeed. So this is my, um, oh God, you can't see it because of the light. This is my tin Mumford & Sons mug. Oh, um, I got it at the concert when we were still doing concerts in the world. Yes. Um, and it has lemon honey tea in it. So very exciting. Um, let's see. I I am a recent theater school graduate, and so I'm just trying to find my <laughs> place as an artist in the uh, pandemic world. <laughs> Wonderful, and you're also a cat mom to an adorable kitten. I am. She's annoying but precious, as they <laughs> are. Hopefully, she'll make a cameo at some point. I close my door, so, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Not will not be making it. Not. <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> Wonderful. And next we have playwright uh, Megan Gove. Hello, Megan. Hi. This is so exciting. So happy to be here. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on and joining us. Uh, you are a member of our uh, one act showcase that Cup of Hemlock is working to produce. And you very graciously accepted our invitation to join us here tonight. So we are so thankful to have you aboard. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your writing, and also what is in your cup. Well, the most important answer is my cup. I have chamomile mm -hmm. tea. Um, very simple. The cup is, does not have a lovely backstory. It's, I think it's from a funeral home. Oh. Um, so <laughs> take that as you will. Just as good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I write plays mainly on a community level. I also produce and sometimes perform. Um, recently, I just graduated from Ryerson uh, from the humanities, one of the humanities programs. Um, just doing projects on the side and next year I'm going to Brock for teachers college. So that's kind yeah. of in the cards. So wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. And of course we have our wonderful literary manager, resident dramaturg, my co-producer of all things, the cup, Mr. Ryan Barakovich. Ryan, tell us what is your ensemble tonight I'm and what is it your shirt? uh is it nothing. flannel that's the question no it is just a regular button shirt i guess um no no, no backstory there i'm sorry with all the lavish costumes in this production i probably should have brought my a game in the wardrobe department but oh well alas poor yorick um but i am drinking out of my official the cup cup you know cup of hemlock on the back i am drinking tea which is quite british so yes. suits the fun, farcical, Noel Coward energy of this production. Yes, very true. I also am drinking from the Cup Cup mm -hmm. as well with my Earl Grey tea. <laughs> and uh, I am wearing a bow tie in honor of all the bow ties that are worn in this production. So there we go. You brought the ensemble game. I, I have to. I mean, Jill isn't here tonight, so mm -hmm. somebody's got to step it up. So there we go. All right. So let's first dive into our first question of the night, which is this show is, as you can see behind me, um, is headlined by Kevin Klein in the title role of Gary Essendon. So what did we all think of his performance? Megan, you can start. I actually really liked it. Um, I thought it appeared to me he knew his character actually quite intimately, and I really enjoyed how he leaned into the physicality, but had these moments of 
being alone and and what he expressed in those moments. I thought it was just like plain old funny. Like um, he remind it, it definitely struck me that he was the star vehicle of the cast and was carrying a lot of the weight. Which I mean, he up like he has strong shoulders. He can do it. Um, but yeah, yeah. I I really enjoyed it and um. I, I guess because I mentally can't picture Kevin Klein, like there's so many Kevins in the Hollywood spectrum that to see him, I was like, oh yes, there he is, one of the Kevins. So it was, yeah, it was a pleasant surprise to see him in um in a theatrical production. Yes, absolutely. Ryan, your thoughts? Yeah, like I I think he was great, and he really like owned the performance. He he was just like this. He was on stage for like most of the time. And even when he's not on stage, there's just all people do is talk about him. And so, you know, it was very clear that he is the beacon of protagonistic light in this production. I've been a big fan of his for a very long time. I think I saw like A Fish Called Wanda when I was like 12 or 13 mm-hmm. years old and, you know, been, you know, a big fan ever since. He's so funny in that movie. And, and like he's also going up against Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, uh, John Cleese, Michael Palin, like good cast in that. And the fact that he stands out so well in it, like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he I think he got an Oscar or a nomination for that. <laughs> just we can find you don't out. have to look it up. It's fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just so, yeah, been a fan of his work for a while, was really happy to see him in this. I thought, yeah, he did a great job and just what a fun energy and, and nuance to the role. like can't complain about anything with it yes absolutely well said uh talia what were your thoughts on mr uh, kevin klein's performance i i thought he was great i thought he was amazing i i think he portrays sort of the internally conflicted actor very well um and you never know what gary is truly feeling as his like his overreacting is mm-hmm. ironically <laughs> very convincing that like, yes, I believe that you're overreacting because you don't know what you don't know what's going on. You don't know how to um, feel your emotions. So I, I definitely um, felt that from his portrayal. And in it, in a technical sense, I love his movements and his voice. And it, I, once I found out that he voices Mr. Fish Odor from Bob's Burgers, I, I could not stop hearing it. I'm like, that's why I love that voice so much. It's so clear. And of course, his facial express- expressions. So definitely A+. Plus. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, Kevin Klein, like he is just, he's, he's done so much work. I mean, like I remember watching him in Chaplin with um, with uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. I first came to him when I watched the 83 film version of Pirates of Penzance, where he plays the Pirate King. He was just in Beauty and the Beast with Disney playing crazy old Maurice. Uh, so I, he, he's, he's just a very malleable actor that has a very kind of, I don't, it's, not, it's not a ding on him to say he has a forgettable face, but he has a face that just kind of blends into whatever production he's doing. I, 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 he has a very famous name, but it's, it's his face isn't one where it's like, you see Meryl Streep's face and it's like, that's Meryl Streep. Here it's like, that's Kevin Klein, but he very seamlessly chameleons himself into whatever role he's being presented with. Uh, once, I, I will say he very easily carried the, the, the charismatic elements of his character of Gary. Like he, It's clear to see why so many people are drawn around him. He has this kind of aura orbit about him that kind of just brings everybody into his house much to his chagrin the one thing i say is he's almost so likable in this that it's almost sometimes hard for him to get into a bit more of the smarmier sides of his character like the fact that he does sleep with his like friend's wife who mind you she does come on to him too so it's it's not just he's taking advantage but there is the character of daphne who opens the play and it's very clear they have slept together and he is very clearly just Filling his night with these young women. Uh, Nick, don't this is you see? <laughs> she lost her latch key. <laughs> latch key, my ass. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. But that's the whole thing, right? Like, I, 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 there is a seedier part to this character that I think Coward was trying to inlay into this. Because once again, Coward was very good at writing kind of biographical, like bringing in some real world people that he knew into the story. Um, so there are elements of that that of. Uh, I don't know if the term is buggery or just like 
just I, I, I just know Coward's ability to kind of add that adulterer side of the character that I think Kevin Kline is just so likable and he's so funny with the actress playing Daphne that it's really hard to like not like him and a part of me is like I shouldn't be liking you so much when you're very clearly taking advantage of this young woman I think like I, I agree for the most part with what you're saying here but I also kind of don't I get because I think as is the case, right? When we get yeah, to these times, we, we so often do agree and disagree at the same time. Um, but yeah, I think where the unlikable aspect did shine through for me is kind of in his man child energy that mm-hmm. like, because he has this whole like coalition of people who curate his life for him and keep him out of trouble and, you know, make sure he doesn't really have to do anything. He really is a big baby in many ways. And he is, but it's th- funny. Like, like it's still very funny. The man child thing is funny and his mm-hmm. overreactions as a man child are funny versus I shouldn't be liking like I'm Gary laughing so much. <laughs> I'm laughing at them, but it's at his ah, expense. And I think gotcha. that's where the unlikability does shine through in his performance. Yeah, so, I can see that. Yeah, I don't think it was as absent as your first comment was giving it credit for. I mean, once again, just like Christopher Plummer and Caesar and Cleopatra, I still like the performance. There's just an element of the performance that I think is a little bit cut short. We're because not relitigating that right now. We're not relitigating Caesar <laughs> and Cleopatra. If you want to watch Ryan and I's very intense debate <laughs> about that, tune into that episode. Maybe it's in the corner right now. Who yeah, knows? Corner. <laughs> but. Yes, that is the thing is I liked it a lot. I just found he was a little bit too likable sometimes to get into some of the... How dare he? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? To get into some of the other kind of seedier parts of who this character is. Um, there we go. Yeah, okay. So which other character do we feel was best performed? Uh, Ryan, I will let you start this one. Okay, well, I I liked a lot of them, but I think my number one shout out has to be Kate Bird. Burton as Liz, his mm. ex-wife. And okay, so fun fact that I discovered by Googling her after because she was just so good in this. Well, two fun facts actually. First of all, she's Richard Burton's daughter. So mm-hmm. that's cool. <laughs> um, you know, no nepotism in showbiz, but you know, she's yeah. really talented, so <laughs> it doesn't make a difference there. But uh second fun fact that she was in the 1982 Broadway production of Present Laughter as Daphne. Oh, I so, can see that. So seeing her come back several decades later to then go on to play Liz, I think is a funny, interesting dynamic, kind of the meta element of Broadway casting. Yeah. But yeah, she is just so, so the dry wit, the so put together in control every moment, the, you know, repetition of you can take my car, it's outside. Like, uh, it's just, she was so funny and in control. And like, unlike other characters like Monica that I also loved that were just like so funny by how exasperated they were. I just loved her being like on top and on charge and in charge. It was like really what sold the portrayal for me. And like somebody had to be that kind of adult in the room in the way. And I thought, yeah, she definitely deserves a shout out for that. Agreed. Agreed. Talia, who was your show? Second, secondary shout out. I'm going to have to agree with Ryan. I, loved Liz I think the character in itself I found that she was very protective of Gary and there's um like an obvious mutual respect shown between both characters towards each other which is a great thing that they were able to um portray that successfully um and I also feel like she plays sort of cunning in a very believable way and it's not I don't feel like it's in a cartoonish way it's just very subtle but yet you can pick up on it and you can believe that that's how a person would naturally think and it's not just like a villainous it's just like she's very smart and she knows what she's doing and well, I once again she's kind of the the pants wearer of that relationship it was very clear that she was the one that drove the the car of, of, of this relationship between the two of them Gary was not the leader in the, in this partnership. She is clearly the one she that steered no, the no, no. <laughs> She's wearing the pants. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In sure. the words of my big fat Greek wedding, the men may have the head, but the women controls the neck and she can turn the head whichever way she wants it, it, it to go. Paraphrase. Yeah. But, that is, but that is very much what Liz was. Liz was the neck of this yeah. story where she turned everybody the way she wanted them to. 
like like the scene where Kobe Smolders is in the is in the study, and she very quickly figures out well, the outside line from the from the study calls into there. I can pretend that she's at my place versus in the study. Like it's that type of very quick mm-hmm. bit of cunning material that makes her a very fascinating, fun character to watch. And there also is genuine love between them too. Like that's yeah. what's really nice is, is is that you can see that there is a genuine partnership and love that. Is, is that is present between the two of them like xy characters are so often demonized and so shrewish yeah shrewish like oh our marriage didn't work because you're awful yeah i hate you <laughs> <laughs> and like i like that there was like some beautiful moments just like the two of them sitting on the couch he like like a baby the baby he is leans his head in her lap and they're just like they're just like having a fine time together there's like yes. no ill will between them <laughs> well the thing yeah. is they actually haven't even divorced like they've separated but she hasn't filed the divorce <laughs> Which right there tells you where it's kind of going to go. Either way. Uh, Megan, what was your secondary cast shout out? Um, I did love Liz, but I think who caught my eye was Colby. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I, how I met your mother, but I thought she was good. I liked her as Robin, too. Yeah. Um, I just it? thought... Yeah. <laughs> It's very defend. controversial to say now after that finale. <laughs> okay, 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 don't talk about the finale. It's not the no, actor's no, no, no. fault that the show was poorly written near the end. <laughs> <laughs> we need a separate episode for How I Met Your Mother. Um, but I did, I did enjoy her. I thought she really captured the glamour, but her coldness and the seduction and the manipulation. She did it. I appreciated she really kind of embraced, like she really seemed to revel and how toxic she is and how manipulative she is. And I think in lesser hands, it would have come off as obnoxious. And I just completely believed her. And that's where I think the charm comes in, especially when you're like, Joanna was very clearly a despicable person and the charm underneath really kind of balanced everything. So like you could hate her, but you're also, you love to hate her as well. So that's, that was my, that was my takeaway. Yeah, no, absolutely. Col- Colby Smulders was, was that very good femme fatale, seductress character. Like she just came in and she owns and she owns the space. Uh, she's a very strong female character in her own right. Like she's just as cunning as Liz is. Mm-hmm. Like the two of them, I, 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 like I would just love to see a play with like the two of them locked in the study together. <laughs> battling it out <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah i don't know why you don't like me i'm really quite nice <laughs> like <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> yeah just some of her line deliveries were so sharp and so yes. funny like agreed uh, yeah mm-hmm. definitely deserves a shout out there's everyone in this cast was really good and, like yeah mm-hmm. my shout out though is um but 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 he uh patel yeah. hmm Bavesh, yeah i think i yeah. think how it's pronounced yeah. Yeah. could be yeah. wrong Behefsh Patel as um, Roland Maul. Mm-hmm. I, that, I loved his, like, he's such a scene stealer. Every time he came on, the energy of the scene just automatically picked itself up. And, and there was a new energy that was brought in, which was great. Because with a, with a show that's all about opening and closing doors, like, the fact that somebody can come on and command the space against Kevin Klein and give Kevin Klein a run for his money <laughs> is fantastic. And on top of that, like at, in in the it's the third act of this play when he comes back on for his final appearance, I couldn't tell if he was truly manic or if he had was what well, uh, he says putting on an act like uh, like, like Gary does. Like there was just no it, the line was so blurred. Like I would love to see this I guy feel play like the he Joker. Was There's part of me that's like let's, yeah, oh, <laughs> like I, I act, yeah yeah. Like I think he is manic. I think I think there's part of I, I think that's the way Noel Coward intended that hip and new age theater character to kind of spy for out of control, uh, which we'll get into later on. But he was just so wonderfully manic. Like, I want to see this guy play the Joker at some point. I think he would be yeah. a terrifying Joker <laughs> just because you just don't know where he's going to go to next. He's, next, he's like, he's like the Tasmanian devil. Mm-hmm. And yet yeah. also there was stillness in, in his manic engine. Like when he goes for the biscuit and goes, I'll leave after I finish my biscuit. <laughs> there's, there's a bit of danger in that where it's like, I don't know if I trust you right now. I don't know what what you're going to do next. There's danger just in his act of shaking your hand. It can dislocate your wrist. Mm -hmm. Apparently. (laughs) It was a funny recurring gag. That was a very funny recurring gag. Yes, but there we go. A fantastic cast all around. Like, it was a very great cast that, 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 that Moritz assembled. So, why don't we talk about our favorite production or design element? Uh, Talia, you can start. 
Um, okay. The set was mm. ugh, French kiss. It was mm-hmm. so gorgeous. I couldn't stop looking at the like the railing sort of decor and like mm-hmm. the gold and like, teal and and like just the clutteredness felt so like natural. I don't know if that's weird to say, but like it's just mm-hmm. like, yes, this makes sense. It mm-hmm. it feels very it feels like um it makes sense with the character. And I noticed at one point, it was a weird detail, but um, when Gary was coming down the stairs or about to come down the stairs, you can actually see the curtain in the window through the big window move. I was like, excuse me, that's excellent. So I couldn't stop (laughs) gagging over this set. It was amazing. Agreed. The set was my shout out as well. Mm-hmm. I loved the natural lived in feeling of that set. Like it felt very natural. It didn't feel false. I love the posters of like his past productions. Like just reading some of them was great. I also love the fact that they kept shouting out Pierre Gint the whole time. That was, that just made me laugh. Um, so. Is that the set's fault? Or, or that the set no, 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 no. No, no, I no. It's just you can see why. I amazing Pierre Gint. I want to see Kevin Klein play Pierre Gint. Just saying. He would be a great Pierre Gint. <laughs> That's what I'm but, saying. But, 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 but it's just like the set inform that type of thing where like this is a guy that clearly has ego about himself, that he has all his posters plastered everywhere. And like you can tell he's leaving the space on his wall for Pierre Gint to show up <laughs> at some point. So that was great. Also, the director, uh, Morris, has used that set so well. Like the big thing when you're directing a scene is finding this, the the spots of power where you can command the space. And he found those for everybody and everybody had their own kind of go-to power spot, uh, which was just fantastic with the central couch being the main kind of power hub that everybody kind of circled around. But they're everywhere on that set. It was just so well done. And the levels that you could play with and the doors, so many doors you can come in and out of. It was just fantastic. It was it, it just added to the proper frenzy that's needed for a farce. So well done to the set. Uh, Megan, what was your shout out? The set was beautiful. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to say the costumes were really impressive mm. to me. All right, just Colby's outfits were outfits. Costume. <laughs> Colby's costume was just amazing. It reminded me of like Kathleen Hepburn or Rita mm-hmm. Hayworth. Like she really had this old Hollywood glamour to her. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I mean, I, it was cool, like that them being in the. Um, I also thought it was funny they were wearing his um, nightgown or his nightgown. Oh my goodness, his pajamas After, in like yeah. the beginning and end of the play. Yes. <laughs> There's like probably six inches between her and the other <laughs> actress. <laughs> That's so interesting how it fits perfectly. But I really loved that element. They they brought that back, and, and costume yes. was just such a beautiful w- way that they used to, that they expressed character. So that mm-hmm. that was my shout out. Agreed. Yeah, no costumes were gorgeously done. Could totally agree. That that was my second behind the set. Absolutely. Ryan, what was so, your shout out? So yeah, obviously the set was my number one, but I had a backup that hasn't been set yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lucky me. Um it's this might be a bit of a cheat answer, but you know, y'all took the good stuff. Um the movement. And I think that kind of comes down to directing and i don't know if there was a choreographer on staff or this but just the movement was all so fluid and the way everybody kind of glided through the space going in and out of the doors the kind of it was almost like a ballet up and down the stairs standing on the stairs while answering the phone handing it to someone down below it just yeah it glided like so fluidly and my kind of favorite movement moment is when liz brings the gift of the new bathrobe to gary and he's like nobody talk for 30 seconds or whatever and he just he like puts it on like it's partly in acting let's once more <laughs> let's compliment kevin klein's acting that he just made that moment so magical but i think yeah just it, it is a testament to the movement being so great and so perfectly timed and choreographed This comedy and especially a farce really does come down to the timing and movement and pacing of all of that stuff. And I've seen a lot of bad productions of farces that just don't get it down and fall really flat. And that was not a problem here. So pacing, movement, all of that really well done. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, no, the blocking of this and the it almost was a bit like noises off, like another very famous farce where it's all about the opening and closing of doors. That's most farces. 
he'd be hard for us to find a parse that doesn't involve doors. <laughs> very few, very very few, if any. But it's the thing of it can it can go badly really fast and become really stale. And this just never let up that way. So, well done there. All right, what all right, what do we think was the weakest part of this production? Megan, you can go first. Um. for some reason i didn't know why there was no lighting like the lighting wasn't very impressive to me. i this mm. is like a random thing but i was like they turned the lights on and off that indicated day and night i don't know i mm. felt like they could have played more with lighting i understand it was in an apartment but like they had the mm. beautiful window they could have done a lot more um mm -hmm. and i felt i don't think any of you are going to agree with me on this one um i felt at times things were a little bit unbalanced between the ensemble members I felt their peak was at the end of it. And I know that's sometimes how the plays work as you get mm -hmm. to that point. The peak was near the end, but I didn't feel a lot of chemistry, if that makes sense. Like I felt no, they all were one, like the acting was fine. It was between each other, like especially with Maurice, Henry and Kevin, those two actors fell flat to me mm -hmm. and their chemistry between each other was not believable. So I felt in that way, I was a little bit, and that's what I meant by like Kevin kind of, for me being a bit of a star vehicle was that it really was kind of relying on his charm and his ability to like command the stage. Um, especially in those moments, particularly with those two other actors where I, I didn't, it wasn't, it was bad. It wasn't that I didn't enjoy watching it. It's just, I didn't believe the chemistry, but I didn't believe they were friends to be completely no. honest. Like it just, no, it wasn't agree. strong enough. Yeah, no. Yeah, I thought you my note too was the two was who, who are the other two? It's um I know I got their names wrong because I just and Red Rogers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got Morris and you got um Henry. Uh, Henry. Morris and Henry, yeah, like they were just very bland to me. It was like like uh Morris was very overacted drunk <laughs> and Henry was very kind of robotic. And it's like, I can see why Colby Spoilers is off <laughs> cheating on you with two other people. <laughs> like, I can very clearly see why this is the way it is. The other thing I will say, though, is the accents sometimes were very generic British. It was like not specific British. Like, like, certain, like you can tell certain actors were just kind of, let me put on a British accent now. Because mm -hmm. clearly we are set in Britain. When this clearly could have been, this clearly could have been an American play. Like, mm -hmm. like it's just because Noel Coward wrote it for British. It, they had to do British accents. Um, but like, particularly like Daphne and Joanne, they were very generic British actors. Well, somebody like Kevin Klein or, or um, Kristen Nielsen or even like um, Helen Harvey with like the Germanic maid, like they have very specific dialect accents where it's like, I can tell where in England kind of Kevin mm -hmm. Klein's class is, where he's from versus like a Daphne and Joanne where I'm like, I don't know exactly which region of England you're from, where exactly, and Morris and Henry had the same type of problem too, where mm -hmm. it was like very generic, kind of like the director being like, and everybody just go put on your best fake British accent that you think upper class posh people will use. Yeah. No real kind of deeper dive into like, are they from York? Are they from yeah. um, Liverpool? Like where in England are these people coming from? Like they, they, could, they can't all be from the same block in London. Like they gotta, they gotta come from somewhere. And I mean, you can tell the difference between somebody from York compared to somebody from like a Cockney compared to something from like a, li a Liverpool accent. There is a very clear dialect difference. So I would have loved to see a little bit more work done on the accent mm -hmm. front. Ryan, I can see you making faces at me. So I guarantee no, you're like, going to disagree on this. No, I, I like I didn't have a big problem with the accents. I, I do. I, I take your point. And I think, yeah, they could have had more variation between them. A lot of them, even if they don't all necessarily come from the same block of London, do come from the same social echelon, you could say. So mm -hmm. it's not unreasonable that their regional dialects might be similar in this regard. Uh, the one I'm kind of, I may be making the most faces at, if that's what you're detecting, is I really liked Daphne's accent. I, and that the actress who played her, uh, Tedra Millen, was almost my cast shout out, actually. Because while her accent was kind of bad and over the top, it suits that character so well mm -hmm. in a way that I loved mm -hmm. and her just being completely like, 
you know, overacting up and coming, you know, starlet wants to be famous. So happy that she got in with, you know, her favorite actor, Gary Esseldeen, Esseldeen, like, yeah, she got it's, her night in the hay with him. Yeah, and like she, it's she's accomplished it. And, and now she kind of has to keep it up is when we're introduced to her at the beginning of act one. So I even though you're right, it was very big and put on. I don't think that's a flaw in her performance here. So that was the kind of maybe the face I was making at that. If others want to disagree, by all means, you can. But I know, Talia, it's, you made like a big face of what looked like agreement. To just my face. Time. I just make big face. It's just my face. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't apologize. <laughs> so, Talia, what was your weakest element? Or no, sorry, Ryan, you didn't tell us what your weakest element was. Uh, yeah, mine's... I probably don't have a lot to say about it now because I know we have a question coming up where it'll probably come up more, but it's actually nothing to do with this production in particular. It's kind of just the plot of this particular show. Mm -hmm. Um, Bit of all over the place, a little meandering, not a lot of focus, but I know we're going to broach this issue later, so I'm happy to leave it. Putting a pin in that. Putting a pin, but that's my weakest element. I just think this maybe isn't Coward's best play. Yes. Shucks. Talia, thoughts? Hey guys, we gotta talk about the accents a bit more because <laughs> I, it, for me, I'm so sorry if this is too blunt, but it was so like distracting to me that it was like taking away, I'm not talking about all of the actors, but um, for some of them, particularly, I'm sorry to screw with you, Megan, but um, Co- Cody or Kobe? Kobe. Kobe. Kobe, Kobe, Kobe Smulders, um, her accent was uh it was just it took away from from the beautiful um like cunning nature and just like the way that she portrayed the character was so like on the nose that I'm upset that I'm so distracted by her accent that it was um you know a generic posh that didn't sound believable right Uh, To me, anyway. I mean, like, obviously everyone's ears and opinions are different. Um, But it was also, I'm sorry, Ryan, but Daphne, (laughs) her accent, and I think is also part of that is like her projecting was a little shouty to me. And like, I, I think there's a very like fine line that you can cross from projecting to just there like to shouting and it was just like I couldn't get in the vibe with her character I didn't like the character because of it because it was just so distracting um and it's so unfortunate because like the the characters I would have loved if if I wasn't just so focused on the accents does that Mm -hmm. mean to say (laughs) no no it's honest I mean that's the thing we are giving an honest critique we're not here to blow smoke Okay. Uh, we are here to give an honest opinion. And if somebody vehemently disagrees, maybe Ryan, he will happily debate you. you know, it's like it's a to each their own kind of thing. I just like and I, I as I said before, I think, yeah, her accent was really big and put on and kind of bad in a way. But because it's a big put on kind of bad character, I thought it worked is all I'll say to that. And and I'm glad you brought up the auditory, Talia, because Mm -hmm. I did notice that too. And I think it's sometimes a preference when you're watching acting. It's like, how are they getting into the shouting thing? I think they made like a joke about this is, it will go down well in New York, his whole like performance on the couch. It's like, oh, we're not in New York. And (laughs) I think the people in New York were supposed to laugh at none of it. They were like, ha, (laughs) but my feelings are hurt. I thought it was really funny. But um, it's true though. I think it can be really it can detract and you're right her it's the pitch I did and I found that with pitch yeah and I found that with her and I found it with Liz sometimes it it was just so over the top it was a little bit of whoa and the same with Monica and I know sometimes that's just Broadway acting and they're they're it's a farce but yeah I think that that's the biggest pet peeve of mine with acting is shouting equal act equals acting and that's not no so I'm really glad you brought that up and it was also it it made me because I was paying attention to the accent, I was paying attention to the voices more. And I found that they had most of the actors, specifically Kevin and uh, who's the woman who plays a uh, uh, Daphne, uh, Tedra Millen. 
especially have quirks in their voices. I think when they're sort of getting into character, um, speaking their character where um, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's kind of like, um, <laughs> I can't do it myself, <laughs> but it's not a laugh. It's just sort of, it's cutting in the dialogue when they speak. I, you know, guys, I wish I could explain this better, but it's something in the voices. Um, like, I just have to go back and watch it because I don't know like how to explain screech? myself. Is it like a weird, like, scre- like they, they speak, but they almost elongate it. It kind of goes into a weird, like, bird call. Like horse, horse yeah. noise. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know if I was crazy. I was just, like, explaining something. You are not crazy. Weird. Well, they're yeah, neighing? They're neighing? Are they neighing? <laughs> are they neighing? Yeah, I was very, I was very confused. But yeah, that's it. Well, speaking of going back and rewatching things, Ryan, as our resident TA, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Is this one you would recommend to, to a student to watch? Okay, yeah, that's all that's always how you frame this question. <laughs> So, <laughs> well, I you are like, a resident TA, so yeah, like I feel like with this one, I'm not going to have a good answer in those terms because certainly if I was designing the syllabus, like I like Noel Coward, I, I, I will admit he is more of a blind spot than other playwrights, like that, especially from this period in me, but like his plays are fine, they're funny, they're good, but like I would probably never put one on a syllabus just because there's not like Life spirit. Uh, that that one I actually I will say I have not encountered ever so maybe but certainly wouldn't put this one since we're reviewing present laughter here I'll kind of uh, present laughter isn't a play that I think has and will get more with like the kind of plot and what's this play even about questions that are coming up later um, that I've prevented myself from commenting on in the weakest section here but yeah it's it's funny it's good. It's popcorn entertainment, I think. Um, but I feel like there's not as much intellectual heft as the author seems to think there is to it. <laughs> um, is that is that bad to put it in those terms? I saw. No, nope, once again, <laughs> honest, honest, honest comments, Ryan. Don't blow smoke. Give an honest comment. Yeah. So like it's uh, if like the prof that I'm working for. Remember, I'm the TA. I don't get to design the syllabus. Not did, yet, Ryan. Uh, You're almost there, though. <laughs> did assi- if so, if the prof assigned present laughter, I would say, hey, I saw this really great production. It's on Broadway HD with Kevin Klein. Watch this, students. Yeah, for sure. Great production of this play. But yeah, it's. I think there's a lot of better plays to watch. But I certainly enjoyed it. I laughed a lot. It was really funny. The acting, for the most part, I thought was quite good. Yeah, solid production, worth a watch in that regard. But maybe now I'll go watch Blythe Spirit and get back to you on that. There's a new film version coming out of Blythe Spirit with, um, uh, what's his name? Downton Abbey. Um, he also played the Beast. In- Dan Stevens. Dan Stevens is doing a film version of it. So you can tune in for that. Uh, uh, Megan, what are your thoughts? Is this one you would recommend to a friend? Would you want to go back and rewatch this on a Friday night? Um, uh, I really, I did enjoy it. it I, I do agree with Ryan that it's it's very fun entertainment. I feel if maybe you're not a play person, that this might be something fun to kind of dip your toes into and be like, mm-hmm. it can be funny um, because it is quite clever. Um, I do agree. It could have gone deeper. Like, I know it's not a critique of the playwright. That's not it. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I. Sorry, I'm just gathering my thoughts here because I. Like, I want to say yes, because it was enjoyable, but I wouldn't say this is. This is the best we've got. This is this is an example of theater. If you're going to see one show before you die, this is it. No. Like, if you're going to go to the trouble of subscribing to Broadway.com, no. Did you pick something else? <laughs> yeah. So I think that's... Well, I guess, sorry, just on that kind of point, would you, I agree that this production, as, as much as I did enjoy it, 
I'm not going to say you got to sign up for Broadway HD to watch this show. I, 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 I would agree with that. Like, I don't think there's any one show on the platform that's good enough for that. But let's say someone has already subscribed to it and is paying uh, yeah. monthly. You're like, hey, I saw something on Broadway HD, present laughter. Would in those terms, if right. they're if it's going to cost them nothing but their time, would you okay. recommend it on those terms? Okay, yeah, I really went do or die there. I <laughs> 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 uh, popcorn entertainment. I'm totally going to r- yeah. rip off if you find. I, That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, uh, Talia. Is this something you would watch with other Ryan? No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that no. honesty. I listen, guys, I have too much candor. It's like a weakness, but I um not this specific production. Um, I personally love No Coward, so it it's it hurts my heart a bit that I wouldn't recommend <laughs> this production to other Ryan. Um, but I you guys, it just comes down to for me specifically, like the things that are distracting and it was the speaking that was, as I mentioned before, that was most distracting. And it just took away from the performances for me. Um, and it's so unfortunate because it's such like in the grand scheme of things, like relatively speaking, it's such a small thing that can be fixed. That's not the writer's fault. That's not necessarily the director's fault. It's it mostly just goes on the actor to practice the 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 accents and uh your you know paying attention to your pitch and whatnot whatnot um and unfortunately it just came down to that so no <laughs> but yeah uh, no very honest thank you Tally, for being so honest i i we appreciate that um yeah i will say like this definitely isn't one of my favorite noel coward plays to be honest i didn't really know this Noel Coward, like I'm more familiar with like Private Lies, Blythe Spirit. This was one that was like kind of on the radar of like, oh yeah, that's another Noel Coward. I haven't gotten into that one in the canon yet. Now that I've watched it, it's like, you're right. It's good popcorn filler where it's like, if you're scrolling through Broadway HD and you like A Fish Called Wanda or Hunchback of Notre Dame or, or like Beauty and the Beast or any Kevin Klein thing, you see that he is the headliner, put it on. It never That's hurts. Quite literally, how it wound up on the docket for this show. <laughs> that is true. That is true. That is true. We we we, we are we are, we didn't even say we are starting a month of Kevin Klein. We have two our, episodes. Our, well, in a month. Yeah. Well, I mean, we uh, yeah, yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> it's our review month of Kevin Klein. So yes, tune in for our next episode where it's another Kevin Klein performance. Uh, but yeah, this one it's okay. It's it's not. Oh my goodness, you're gonna like die if you don't see it. But it's like if it's there, yeah, give it give, give it at least a watch once. Never hurts to watch something once, and then you can walk away going, seen it, done it, probably never see it again. Let's get into though some play questions, some more text-based meaty questions. And I see Talia is already excited about this. So Talia, as a Noel Coward fan, uh, do you believe that Gary is ever truly genuine at any point in this play, or is he always putting on a facade or acting? So I wrote in my notes a very big chunk because I kept going back and forth between my opinions. So I'm definitely going to contradict myself in this answer, and I'm so sorry. But I think that the character is very like contradicting. <laughs> in, um, I feel like... I think it was in act one. He literally says, I'm always acting. And he's like, aha, so you're self-aware. But then he continues to do it. And he knows that it bugs the people around him that they never know what he's truly feeling. But he continues to do it. And I think, and I said this at the beginning, that he is sort of um, like internally conflicted. And he and he's putting on, in my opinion, what I see from the character he's putting on a facade and he doesn't want to like kind of deal with like real people emotions he deals with his acting actor you know on stage emotions his person his celebrity personality and that's it um so in (laughs) short form I do think that he's always acting because he doesn't know how to be genuine 
Yeah. No, actually, that makes total sense. I have very similar notes okay, where I went, cool. this is a man who, in order to hide from his true emotions, a majority of the time he is putting up a facade to, to, to shield himself from ever feeling her. Because I think like, his temporary separation from Liz really has rocked him and, his, and, his, and has left him rudderless. So he's kind of left drowning in his emotions. And to survive, he's holding up to this piece of wood in the water that is, let me mask myself with my fake actor emotions mm -hmm. that I can kind of hide what I'm truly feeling. And I think there are two key genuine moments where we see him drop the, the armor. And it's when Monica is going to leave right before he goes to South Africa, because he has that moment of, I really do wish you were coming with me. Mm -hmm. I really do. Because she technically, like, it's his work wife. Monica is his work wife. Uh, as, as a term uh, and she really does genuinely care about him as well and the fact that he gives her that kiss on the cheek there is that real genuine moment of he is going to miss her he's, he's gone for six months like he is generally going to miss this person that is his he might die he might as die he you never know Back that's then, him acting possible. when he says that <laughs> yes. yeah. but it's that thing of there and then also and, and, and then also when he's then left alone when he, and he thinks he's all by himself in the house or he really has to come to like we all have had that moment where we're great on putting on a facade in front of people but then the minute you're alone there's no one to put the facade on for and it just has to crumble and you see him just kind of oh i'm truly and then the best thing is he has to put those walls back up again because the german maid very quickly surprises him. Can, can I piggyback off of this? Like what you're yes. bringing up here? Yeah. One more, yeah, one more yeah. moment though. Sure. And it's, it's at the very end between him and Liz. When, when he has the final line about, I'm like, we're, I think he's just like, I'm glad that, that like you bought your ticket or something like that. Where like they're, they've now reconciled with each other. Mm -hmm. Like they're all, I think there is, I think there's a genuine moment of happiness where he goes, I don't have to keep facading here and sleeping with younger women and, putting up with these people because I have you. So I, I do think there are some, there are a few genuine moments, but I think a majority of the time it is a facade that he's putting up to protect himself. Ryan, piggyback. Okay, well, piggyback off, like, what I, the main thing I was going to talk about are those moments, like, when mm -hmm. no one else is there, especially in the final act. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there, it's very brief, but there are the moments when no one's on stage or someone's locked in another room and he kind of like puts his hands down on the table and just like sighs and you're like okay mm -hmm. there it is but then what happens immediately after doorbell rings again and and it's not enough that he's just like well now i have to act but every single time he goes to the mirror and fixes his hair <laughs> and that is him quite literally getting into costume and mm -hmm. there is like they do it they play it as a joke the one time when he's like ah forget it but like that's not him deciding i'm not gonna act in this mm -hmm. moment but it is like yeah he the whole play is set up to prevent him from breaking this facade and being genuine in a way it's all about how when you live this kind of busy actor life it does become you and you're never not on stage because you're always surrounded by other people and i would challenge the assertion that you just made mac about how he's genuine with liz especially in that last moment because to me the last moment seems like a real put on the play's almost over we need to make a happy ending kind of moment and that it does have that real kind of like old hollywood classic comedy like feeling of the big hooray conclusion that that's acting it to me like i don't know if that's the genuine we'd still love each other let's i return. think kevin klein plays it as genuine mm -hmm. it could be noel coward was kind of very quickly wrapping up his play and that's the way he did but i think kevin klein as, as an actor choice plays that as a genuine moment even if the plot is very rushed at the end he is playing it as i am thankful because he's now at all these people saying they're going to go to africa with him and it's like he's he's getting really frustrated <laughs> it's really frustrating the fact he's genuinely happy that liz of all people has agreed to go that is the but one he doesn't person seem happy. happy about it when she first mentions it he kind of warms up to the idea at the end he, well, I think that's the, well. It's well. He warns up after she says, "I don't want a divorce," mm -hmm. because because now he knows he can invest in her as someone uh, who doesn't like putting their heart out there. And clearly, his heart has been hurt by Liz's separation. That the fact that he doesn't want to show any type of true emotion about her going because he doesn't know 
where she is on the game board. It's not till she finally lets her guard down and says, I want to get back together with you. I don't want to be apart anymore. Uh, that's when he goes, oh, okay, I can now reinvest in you. And I can show my true happiness because he, once again, he's somebody who's hurt and he's putting on the facade to protect that throat, that, 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 that break in his heart. And now he can take that down in front of her because he knows he doesn't have to play anymore. Because once again, it's a thing of the classic trope of when you're separated, you always got to put on that facade to show that you're doing better than, the, the, than your partner, even if you are dying inside while trying to move on. Like he's going to put on that facade in front of Liz just to be like, I've gotten over you. It doesn't matter that we that we were married and now you're separating from me. I'm doing just fine. I got Daphne going here. I got Kobe Smolders coming in to hit on me. I'm doing a okay, but really he's hurting. He's hurting, and I think that's why at the end he's finally able to drop it because Liz has shown that she's willing to get back with him. So yeah, yeah. Megan, your thoughts? Or no, Ron? Did you have any last minute things to add? Uh, no, that was kind of it. Like that sort of was just a thought that came to me in response to what you were saying. I like my main thought was that the play is designed to present prevent him from having the genuine moment that every time he gets a little glimmer of finally alone breathe someone else walks in and then the hair who kind of has this perfect signifier for that but i also kind of think to talia's point um because he's been doing this for so long and it's become him i do wonder is there a tipping point where the act actually becomes his personality and like we talk about how oh he can't be genuine because he's acting and he's always acting but yeah like is you know if you've lived your whole life on the stage and treat the world as your stage at what point is that just who he is do we have to like peer gint find the kernel of the onion after you peel away all the layers and find the true genuine essential self there um and i don't know if there's a good answer to that you know we can talk about like performance theory and performativity and how you know we're all putting on some kind of role like Irving Goffman and all that rot but um but yeah I, I kind of wonder like I think the entire play and we'll come to this probably in just a minute is structured around the idea that someone who lives their life in the stage can't ever be genuine and I think it's worth questioning if that's a different kind of genuine that he is an actor through and through and acting is his genuine self mm -hmm. no that's a good question very very good question megan what are your thoughts about gary and his genuineness versus performative qualities um i think everybody's kind of voiced what i'm thinking as well um i think yeah i I'm just, double piggybacking here but I, I i do honestly think because he's an actor and because the world he lives in demands of him an artifice he's going that that is his de defense mechanism that is the only way he orients himself in the world and even like i i think near the end of the play him and his friends have it all they they have it all out they're like you're i'm actually i'm better than all of you because at least i'm honest about what i'm up to and i thought that actually contradicted very nicely to this idea that he performs all the time. He doesn't know truth when he sees it. And the fact that like, even though he's swarmy and, you know, like was trying to keep his affairs literally tucked into the spare room, there is an honesty to him mm -hmm. under like at the same time that he's performing. Mm -hmm. And what I found most intriguing was how his circle, and this, and this kind of feeds into his idea of um, being genuine or not is that his circle is very resistant to outside influence. Like there is, they have their thing. They have this world they've crafted between each other and any interference, they like, it's almost violent. Like Colby, um, Mole, I'm not saying they're actor names, my apologies. One of them is the actor name. Um, the playwright is going to be so misguided. Okay. <laughs> and um, oh, what's his name? Henry um, Morris and, and uh, Colby Smolder's character. Or is it? Daphne, I'm trying to Daphne. think about the outside influences. Yes, <laughs> thank you, yeah. Um, they're, like, humiliated, uh, they are um, alienated, and then they are dismissed. And I think that, and then at the ending, he gets back with his wife. And I think that was a really apt way of describing what this theater world kind of, in, in Coward's mind, looks like. Of the, Nobody gets in on this. Like, this is, and, and yeah. I, I, we're going to touch on this with the commercial theater and um, a theater of ideas, but I think 
he is it is his artifice this is this is all he knows and mm -hmm. gen what is genuine mm -hmm. he, does he even know what it means is as genuine as he can be you know mm -hmm. what I, i'm trailed off completely i like completely didn't finish the thought but that <laughs> that was where my mind was going i get where you're going i get where you're going i i get it yeah like his friends have created this bubble world for him to live in where he kind of never does have to stop acting mm -hmm. and it, well, it's interesting that he's the one who kind of has the monologue to morris in act one about you know be careful about joanna because these outsiders are trying to ruin this perfect little thing that the five of us have created mm -hmm. and yet it's <laughs> like what well, you could debate whether or not it was henry who brought joanna into the fold but it it's always gary who seems to be responsible for bringing the outsiders in certainly he did like the biggest f up with joanna he brought in daphne it's yeah. you know he lived to regret it but he also agreed to see roland mall like yeah. yeah like he he's the one who's like on his high horse about keep our little insular coterie sacred and yet he's the one probably because he's spiraling in his near divorce situation but he's the one who doesn't practice what he preaches and ruins it for everyone else or <laughs> almost ruins it exactly yeah absolutely well ryan you've been alluding to this since we started here so this play is a true uh uh farce uh fashion uh play <laughs> It has a lot of things going on. Uh, what would you say is the plot or the play's main plot line? And do you feel Noel Coward's writing style here creates a clear and focused narrative? So to start with the second part, no, I don't think it does. I think this play is very unfocused, very all over the place. It's not a comment on all Coward plays, most of which I have not read or seen. But this one in particular really feels all over the map to me. And... Uh, it's, yeah, and I think that is the big thing that impeded me from liking it as much as I could have or maybe wanted to, that, like, 55 minutes in to the proceedings, we get the first mention of Joanna, and that, like, we're almost an hour in, and the, like, if we're talking about what is the main kind of plot line, it's how Gary is his through kind of having this tryst with Joanna in act two kind of throws their whole little ecosystem amok and on a thematic level it's challenging you know the truthfulness and genuine ideas of the acting profession that we just interrogated a moment ago but plot wise it takes us way too long to get to the main thing that it's about and then when you actually kind of like time how long <laughs> that plot line really is a kind of yeah less than half of the show is even devoted to that the rest kind of just seems to be showing about the the silly going ons and the life of a famous actor and i know on the broadway hd description at least to dip into the paratext a little bit this was described as a semi-autobiographical play by coward and I don't actually know if Coward was an actor himself or if he just like equated the life of a famous playwright to the life of a famous actor or if he also performed. Maybe someone in the group knows better than I do on this. Pause for answers. No. Nope. OK. Alia, do you know? As a Coward fan? I don't think so. I don't think I have any thoughts coming to mind at the That's moment. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I've never studied him like in a biographical context to know that I do, but as someone who kind of spends a lot of time thinking about autobiographical resonances in theater and plays like this, I I see this as one of the more self-indulgent examples, or certainly that like he wanted to tell this story about what it's like to be famous and how being a man of the theater turns you into this kind of grotesque creature of theatricality. And uh, because that is kind of a simple point that gets hammered in over and over and over again, I kind of don't think we need such a long play to convey it. Not that the play was too long or a bore to watch. It just, yeah, seemed like a lot of redundancies that were just... It ultimately came down to man it sure is tough to be famous and <laughs> you know and honestly because i do think that joanna's interference and the various you know intimate relations that spin out of that does seem to be the main plot line that's at least animating the action here 
it's kind of weird that that doesn't seem to have a lot of bearing on the thematics that we've talked about already that it's not about like oh he can't be genuine and that's why he has an affair with joanna like that just kind of seems like hey drama thrown on top of the lives of these characters to justify this being a play in a way and i feel like if we do cycle back to perhaps the main main plot line is his relationship to liz and the culmination of returning to her being the thing that ultimately ends the play and gives the drama meaning i guess the joanna relationship is an obstacle to that but it was never a major obstacle in a way like liz it's not like he and liz were working things out maybe getting back together then he sleeps with joanne and she's like how could you and that becomes the big drama that needs resolution by the end like liz is so on top of things and on charge and like ready to take out the trash pardon the idiom but and like it and it's just so they're like okay he can't handle himself i will go back to him and Mm -hmm. If my answer is sounding stringy and meandering here, I think that's a reflection on the play being pretty <laughs> stringy and meandering. Um, I, that's like you planned it that way. I <laughs> you didn't. did. I didn't. I just, yeah, I, I think, I don't know if like, you know, certainly in the British theater and ecosystem of the time, if dramaturgs were how prevalent or how much of a role they had in the actual like, writing process of like a premiere production of a play like this but i think a dramaturg probably could have trimmed a lot of fat from this and but again a lot of the fat and the fluff i did find entertaining the character of roland who i know we'll talk about more in the next question hey we're constantly feeding into next questions you could cut his entire thing and it would not change a thing from the play he is just a haha isn't it funny how crazy i am and sure a side thematic discussion comes up in like the debate about you know the nature of art that he winds up having with gary but that seems almost superfluous to the main theme that we've already talked about um yeah and he doesn't aside from the fact that he's one of the other people who's going to join him in africa and wow think of the crazy people you have to deal with when you're famous like it kind of ties into the main thrust of it but really isn't adding much i guess Mm -hmm. so yeah long way of saying and now i think this play is a bit of a mess but i still enjoyed it kind of i guess (laughs) i enjoyed kevin klein i don't know what to tell you (laughs) talia what are your thoughts because once again you are a noel coward fan this is is this one of your fave noel cowards or is this like kind of like the one you're kind of like he wrote it sure he wrote it, sure. You know, like <laughs> I mean, so I I'm looking at my notes and I didn't have much of an answer. <laughs> but it it was mostly just my thought about this question was that each or most characters, I think, have their own plot line going on with Gary and that there's not much connection going on between each other. It's just all, like Gary's in the center and everyone else is just like interacting with him in similar ways different ways as like an individual character but similar ways in terms of like the plot <laughs> uh, like for example I feel like the plot is mostly done the same just in different ways with most of the women so with mm. Daphne Joanna and Liz they all think that they know the true Gary um, in different ways. So Daphne, and they also have like different, you know, relationships with Gary. Obviously Daphne thinks of him more as a like sexy mentor type. Like He's I look up to fox. Silver <laughs> Fox. Joanna lusts after him. And Liz, I feel like is more pure, pure than the other women that uh, Gary sleeps with <laughs> in this play. But it just, it felt very, unfortunately, like copy paste, just mm. like slightly different. Um, you know, this is so random, but you guys know those memes where it's like, <laughs> where it's like, um, well, you can copy my homework, but just like make sure that it doesn't look 
the same, like do this so that it doesn't change a few words. <laughs> change a few words. It doesn't look the same. That's what it reminded me of. That makes total sense. I yeah. now that you say it that way, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I totally see that. I totally, totally see that. Megan, what are your thoughts? Um don't you love it when the women revolve around the men in the story? <laughs> Such a classic trope. Mm. Gotta Must love be perpetuating it. Perpetuating that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love it. Thank you, Noel. Um, yeah, I, I really don't have too much to add. I, I, I really liked your point about the women's relationships being incredibly similar. Um, mm-hmm. I'm looking at my notes too, and I feel like there's not too much to add on to except. Um, you know what? No, I'm gonna put a pin in it. No, oh. <laughs> put a pin in it. All you guys said, just it close it shut. <laughs> all, right. all right, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, nail in the coffin. Yeah, nail in the coffin. Let's finish this. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'll say, I think the story is supposed to focus around Gary getting back together with Liz. I think that is the driving center that everything keeps coming back to. Like, Liz, he, he keeps bringing Liz back into his orbit every time she leaves. Like she is coming back in, whether that's by him or by her setting it up herself. But like he keeps going back to her. And so it's, the, it's these two of these people getting back together. I think that's what the main cause, but it gets lost very easily, very quickly with a bunch of other random, non important side plots and things like that. I, I, think the, I think the only reason why the Africa plot is there is just to give this a time uh, limit. Like it's kind of like, in that great Seinfeld episode, the Chinese restaurant where they spend half an hour waiting for a table. And apparently in the original draft of that uh, uh, script, there was no uh, um, plan nine from outer space ticking movie clock. That was added by the, by, 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 by NBC as like, a, you have to put some type of ticking clock in there to give it some agency. And I think that's what this Africa going to Africa thing is. It's that we needed some type of agency or else it's just going to be like, events happening in it like in a guy's apartment there's no real agency without that africa time bomb well that yeah. eventually blows up at the end but i'm glad you're bringing that up because well as far as ticking time bombs go it's pretty low stakes he's going yeah. for six months as exoticized as he's built up africa in his mind he's probably gonna survive and come back just fine and uh, like i you know there's some messed up kind of colonial stuff going on in the every time they mention africa but uh, mm-hmm. we don't need to unpack that further but like um, which country which country yeah, in just, africa well, it is a tour so maybe it's multiple <laughs> countries i'll give the benefit okay. of the day but okay. yes it is just this big vast exotic dark continent that uh, he's going to but uh but yeah like as far as taking time bombs go like it's not really putting pressure on his ability to reconcile with liz like it's Mm -hmm. he will be back maybe they'll give it another go then before she decides to come with him maybe they won't but it's and, and this is what i was kind of saying earlier about like the whole i agree that the relationship to liz and the reconciliation since that is what ends the play kind of should have been the through line but so many of the things that happen throughout are not obstacles to that or do not yeah. feed into that. Mm-hmm. So the play is kind of just a bunch of things that are happening in the same apartment <laughs> to the same people, but like yeah. they don't seem to feed into each other at all that you can't really single out anything as, you know, this is what it's about. This is what it's trying to be. Oh good. These two characters are back together. Now we can close the curtain because it's over. Like, yeah. Daphne and Roland are still planning on coming to Africa, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> like, like that's the, the, the story's not over here. I never got. Like, like it ended in a really weird way where I'm like, we still not resolve the Roland or the Daphne elements of the story. Like, we resolved the Colby Smolders, mm-hmm. uh, Joanna's plotline and, and the partner's plotline. Uh, but there's still two people locked in two separate rooms. Both of whom have tickets to Africa. Yeah. That, <laughs> I it, hope they no wind up in the same country as each other. They might not. <laughs> but that was my thing was like, are they setting that up because Roland does show up and like him and Daphne are going to become a pair? And like that's they, how it was going to end? And it's funny because they specifically make a point of not 
commenting on it, but they're the same age, these two characters. Yeah. They're both like 24 or 25, I think yeah. it was. Mm-hmm. It's like I was waiting for the moment where the two of them would fall in love and that would solve two of his problems at once. And they yes. never even interact with each other. No. Like it's missed opportunities galore in this play. And that's why no, I don't think Howard, it's what were you doing? <laughs> I genuinely thought that they had like forgotten about yeah. <laughs> Daphne and, and Mole in the other rooms and I kept looking at the, the time thing I'm like there's there's three minutes left but they have most of that resolved. was curtain call <laughs> yeah most of that was curtain call <laughs> <laughs> gotta give Kevin Klein those four standing ovations <laughs> oh lord yeah. yeah there we go okay final question of the night and Megan I'll let you start this one because you kind of alluded to it uh, early on but so in Act One, Gary and Roland uh, debate the merits between commercial theater versus theater of ideas. Based on this place arguments, where do you think Coward uh, falls in the in this debate? And which side would you take in this arg- in this argument? Um, I'm, in full honesty, I'm not really sure where Coward falls. Like the messiness of the narrative lends itself to confusion. Mm-hmm. Um, what I thought was interesting was that you kind of start the debate in the sense of the play where the opposition is depicted as mad. Like, mm. Mole is arguably deranged. And he's presenting these ideas of this is the theater of the future and is asking for his expert opinion. And the way Mole is tread by um, <clears throat> uh, Kevin Klein's character is, we shouldn't believe him. It's I think on that basis, it's, oh no, theater of the, the theater of ideas is baloney. But at the same, to- <laughs> but at the same token, maybe that's exactly the point: is he is dismissive of this new idea the way he is dismissive of all new ideas in his life that contradict his mm-hmm. self concept of "I'm an actor." Mm-hmm. And even as the truth, and they, they kind of allude to it, the truth is staring you in the face. Mole's literally telling him, "Like this is the future. Like you got to mm-hmm. like start." playing different characters, which is so funny that he was like, you play the same character every time and it's a farce and it's satirical. It's great. Um, but it it kind of lends itself to the idea that maybe Howard is in his kind of subtle way saying mm-hmm. the theater of ideas is maybe worth more of a look at. Um, personally, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm always a little suspect of commercial theater, th- but those binaries are very strong. And I mm-hmm. think a balanced perspective like there's nothing really wrong with writing a play with entertainment as one of your objectives you generally generally want your audience to stick around like i don't think that's like a bad thing and then the other idea and and i liked how they they said it's like oh this is gibberish that you're you're it's pages of psychoanalytic bull and i'm like i felt called out slightly um <laughs> And then he's just, and I, and I thought it was interesting that he he eventually concedes. Mole's like, you're he kind of what a weird way about it. He was like, you're part of my life. I'm in love with you. I, I don't know what else he was saying, <laughs> but he kind of concedes to him being the expert opinion. And I think at the end of the, in my own opinion, that the play probably doesn't say this. It's a marriage of the two, and probably of a bunch of other different genres as well. Like theater's not once you put theater into a box in that way. And when she were like, I just write populist or I'm only involved in theater of ideas, it's like mm-hmm. you're boxing yourself and like that is like not mm-hmm. a creative mm-hmm. way of thinking. Yeah. So I, I think that personally, I, I like versatility and mm-hmm. theater isn't, can't be just one thing. And I think Howard was maybe in his own subtle way trying to mm-hmm. nod his head towards the pitfalls of mm-hmm. stepping into one camp or the other. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'll piggyback off you on that because my note as well for the second part of the question is theater should be a balance. Uh, but to answer the first part is I do think Coward is falling more on the Gary side of the argument because, yeah, as you said, Noel Coward depicts uh, Roland as manic and crazy and this psychological madman. Um, and on top of that, like, this isn't Gary's story about changing his ideas of theater. Gary very clearly from A to B to to Z is sticking with his ideas about playing these classic characters and also wanting to play Pierre Gint. Uh, but there's like, no ideas is, in that play. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I mean, that's why the friends don't want him to play Pierre Gint is that he doesn't have the ideas to play Pierre Gint. That he would that he would play it very commercial, farcical, very kind of 
when it, which is funny because Kevin Klein's a very versi- versi- versatile actor. Like, he is someone who is very malleable and has done commercial as well as indie work. But mm-hmm. here, his character is very much based in the commercial land. And I think Coward, because he was writing a lot of these commercial farces, was airing more on the side of the Gary side of the argument going like, if it's not broke, like, don't fix it. Like, if it's not butter, do fix it. Um, you know, uh, and I, th- I, I think that's what Coward was trying, because once again, this came out at a time when theater of ideas, when psychology was starting to have some traction, right? So it, it was still very kind of a new age thing. And you have this very statesmanly writer going, Pah! theater of ideas, all the playwrights are manic mad people. And the fact that this is semi-autobiographical, and maybe Roland is based on some random new ideas playwright that stopped Coward. I don't know. I don't know Noel Coward's biography well enough that he that maybe there is a basis of Roland's character. Uh, to the second part, though, theater should be a balance. Any piece of good theater plays both sides, whether that's in a musical where like where like with Les Mis, for example, it's commercially enough that people go for the barricade. But for the theater people who know music enough, they're, they'll are listen to the album over and over again and find the different motifs, lyrical motifs, deeper meanings that were etched into the music and, and the stuff. But there is a nice surface level skim of cream that audience. It's, it's like WandaVision right now in the uh, on Disney+. Plus. That is another show that for general audiences, it's fun. They're doing different sitcom styles every episode like they just did a modern family episode but then you have this easter egg underbelly that has created this whole online following of people dissecting this show to the nth degree for easter eggs and thematic things that are tying over from episode to episode so i think any good piece of art should do both it should give general audiences something that they can watch and want to come back to and even general audiences if they come back to it repeatedly like if it's a really good MCU movie, they're going to start finding these Easter eggs that somebody who already knows the source material has already found. And it's that nice thing of like, even it's funny, like I was watching, it was on Instagram and there was a post done uh, about, about James Cameron's Titanic. And it showed the two different versions of Jack on the staircase, right? Like there's, there's him in his tuxedo and there's him at the end. And I didn't even catch this until the, until I w- looked at the image, but the clock in the second picture, when it's at the very end of the movie, is stuck at the same time the Titanic went under, like finally went under at two twenty a.m. I had never caught that in in like twenty plus years that movies been around. I'd never caught the clock and how that, unenriched your experience of the movie was prior to knowing this knowledge. Right, like, but now that I know it, it's it's a nice <laughs> bit. It's a nice touch by James Cameron that he put in this extra bit of detail, this extra bit of work, and I think that's what a good piece of art should do. It should have that extra bit of work for people who want to find that extra bit of work, but it can be accessible enough that people aren't feeling ostracized if they don't get it because that's how you frustrate general audiences and that's how your art will die because you need general audiences to fill your theaters sorry people why do you think Les Mis has run for 35 plus years there's something in it for everybody it's not just one thing there you go uh Ryan as a play writer yourself what are your uh feelings on this so topic? bit of an agree and a disagree again <laughs> That, of course, right. Okay, I'll I'll start with just what are my thoughts in this debate before cycling back to what do I think the play is saying, just because right. sort of dovetailing off of some stuff that both of you have said so far. Um, I disagree with the assertion, Mac, that you've made that good art has to do both. I think a lot of good art does both, but I don't think like. To be good art, you must be commercially viable. I think there's a lot of really great art that is not commercially viable, and that's okay. And we shouldn't say sure, if you're not if, selling out big, big But if theaters. that's the case, then that, that's a very limited spectrum of people you're going to get. And? Well, you want your art to be seen by as many people as possible. That's Not everyone wants doing. that. that, that means, not everybody but, wants to. Well, that's not a good business model to have. Not you're only going to write one, maybe one good thing. Though. Art so this, is business. Now, art I, is a business I, like anything else. There is an there is an arts industry, but that doesn't mean that to create art must be business. If I just put on a show with five of my friends in my backyard, put around posters around the city, and some people come see it, some people don't, is that not still art? Just because it doesn't make a lot of money, 
<laughs> that is art. That absolutely. There you go. And that backyard piece can grow if it's popular. It doesn't have to grow. I'm happy with the one-off night we've had. (laughs) That's still art. I'm saying I don't like this kind of false taxonomy that we're creating here between. I feel like this is a bigger roundtable conversation, Ryan. And probably will be. But but I guess kind of my point here is like, yeah, I think since we always keep coming back to Les Mis here, Les Mis is full of ideas. Les Mis is commercially successful good job checking both that was the plan there Mm -hmm. maybe some of its ideas are actually kind of harmful about how you know you don't need to you know incite revolution because it's bound to fail and we're all gonna you know just wind up in heaven eventually so just be happy with your place in life is quite literally what lame is is saying the musical at least i haven't read the book um (laughs) so like yeah like the ideas are present but not all ideas are good and kind of are necessarily propagating good ideas here um so i i yeah i kind of fight but lay miz is a story of redemption you can <laughs> you can do wrong and that's that's valjean's whole art yeah, but it's also about the failure of the revolutionary spirit we're not talking about <laughs> lay miz in this review um, does the revolution fail i mean the whole last song is about <laughs> Joining a, the barricade, no matter after like, they're all dead, they're dead and they failed, <laughs> but it's the spirit that lives on. They continue to play. You really don't seem to have done a very close reading of it, I must say. <laughs> um, but I here we go. Okay, so bringing it back to present laughter. <laughs> so I think that there it's perfectly well that we can have both of these things, and I'm not poo pooing on commercial theater. It exists. It's great. A lot of it contains great ideas. Not all of it does. It doesn't have to. I I don't, I like what Megan said about this kind of false binary between ideas and commercialism. Like, I don't think, I think it's condescending to think that containing ideas is anathema to public interest and the ability to make money. So like to say that, oh, the public won't like it because it has ideas. Oh, how can you have that? I think that's just like a silly assertion. But I think you can have a really good show chock full of ideas that might not make a lot of money and that doesn't denigrate its status as art. And I, while we are not, you know, given the pleasure of reading Roland's play that may or may not actually be brilliant, we don't know. <laughs> like, I kind of see Roland, I don't think this is who Coward was basing him on in particular, but I see Roland as kind of like Antony Nartot who was a madman, quite literally spent most of his life, you know, raving and screaming and died painfully of cancer in an asylum in the end. But he was not appreciated in his time and he was not recognized kind of for the genius that, you know, later theater people would see him as. But he was onto something and kind of did come ahead of the time that would appreciate him and really did trailblaze for a lot of what came ahead of him or after him but that said could you imagine being in a room with Anthony Artaud he he would have been nuts and it probably would have been (laughs) like the Gary Rowland dynamic that we see in this play and I could understand why most people wouldn't want to work with him and not like understand and appreciate his ideas so I and yeah like most Artaud inspired theater these days we're still even if it's given like artistic merit isn't commercially viable for the most part or really and like certainly you won't see like an arto inspired like big mega musical for example um but yeah a lot of thoughts about this i do yeah i think good taxonomies operate upon a principle of mutual exclusivity and i don't think mutually ex- it's mutually exclusive to say that you can either want to make money or you can have ideas and even if we do see that as a rigid binary, they're different things for different purposes. To the first part of the question, what do I think Coward is saying here? So just as I earlier said, I don't think this play, Present Laughter, has a lot of intellectual heft to it. Based on the conversation between Gary, the, our kind of autobiographical author surrogate, and the other playwright he doesn't like very much. I get the sense that this play was quite literally written as a refutation of people who insist all theater has to have big ideas. 
and commercial theater is bunk and it's not real art. I think Cowards maybe, it maybe wasn't the main plot thread that goes through it, but certainly that this is the most like meaty debate that's had in the entire play. I think this is Cowards standing up for commercial theater, for art for art's sake, and really planting his flag and not everything has to be about big things. And our inability to find big things thematically happening in this play maybe was by design in that regard. <laughs> that said, uh, and, you know, it's quite also just it's quite clear and this has been touched on already that because Roland is portrayed as a madman, that is coward being like, this is how these people look to me. The people who poo poo on me because they they don't, you know, like my theater or they think my theater is not intellectual enough. They're all crazy people and they secretly love me. <laughs> like that, that is the argument he's making about his aesthetic rivals. And I think that's, that's a little like psychologically shady um, to say the least. <laughs> um, but that's also said, like in terms of if this is an argument for aestheticism and for art for art's sake, I don't think it does a great job of that <laughs> just because of what we talked about, how as entertaining it is, there really isn't a lot there. Have, have any of you seen the, it's the Preston Sturges movie, Sullivan's Travels? Uh, no, oh. none of you. Okay. So Preston Sturges, he was a filmmaker and a playwright from like the kind of early talky period, kind of probably contemporary of cowards and made some brilliantly genius, funny films. Highly recommend if you haven't seen any of them, put, put them on the list. But Sullivan's Travels is very much the, it is Sturgis sticking up for why he makes kind of light comedies and very much like I kind of think Coward was trying to do with this. And the protagonist is a filmmaker who really like wants to make movies for the people to, you know, become class conscious and rise up against their oppressors. And he's, you know, not very successful at it. So he goes on this big sort of like Dust Bowl, Steinbeck-esque journey through America to kind of try to get in touch with the people and understand their problems because he's elite and out of touch because he's a, you know, big hotshot filmmaker. And I'm going to spoil the ending of this very old movie because I can't really make this point without it. But anyway, in the end, he gets arrested, long sort of series of shenanigans that lead to it. And he's in a prison and he's like at his lowest and it's movie night at the prison and they show a Mickey Mouse cartoon. And the prisoners are loving it. They're laughing and rip rolling and like it's just so much fun for them. And he's like, ugh, Disney cartoons, <laughs> like because he's so much higher than thou. <laughs> but then something happens while he's watching it with the prisoners. He starts to chuckle. It's kind of funny, actually. I never really gave it a chance. And that chuckle snowballs into a bigger laugh. And suddenly he's laughing uncontrollably. And everyone in the prison is just having a great time watching this really fluffy cartoon that puts their mind out of their troubles for just like five minutes. And so when he finally, you know, gets out of prison and kind of like, you know, realizes the error of his ways, he recognizes that what the people need isn't necessarily like this big high-minded class conscious stuff that there is room for the fun things that actually do just make you laugh and make you enjoy your time. And I think that's such a more nuanced take of the same theme than what we're given in this play where it doesn't actually like demonstrate the value of commercial theater. I think it thinks it does just by being a commercial property in its own right, but it's not, we never do see something within the narrative of this play that proves Gary right. He's just much more better spoken than Roland, so he's able to make his case better. But yeah, there isn't like, I don't see this play as actually proving its own assertion correct here. And I'm not saying that because I disagree with the assertion. I think Preston Sturgis did a great job of making that assertion assertion in a better piece of art it's not focused enough to make its point yeah and it's argument. and if the argument is that oh commercial theater is all fluffy bunk and we shouldn't like it i kind of feel like if you are already of that mind this play will not only not prove you wrong but actually might affirm your suspicions <laughs> so long way of saying a lot of nothing i guess 
In true present laughter fashion, Ryan. <laughs> there we go. It's all connected. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Talia, ra- like s- summarize all that we've said with mm. your own thoughts. Or co- add completely different thoughts. Yes. <laughs> Listen, okay. I... <laughs> Um, I, yes, a lot that w- is written in my notes has already been said. I have no new ideas about Les Mis that I didn't even think that we <laughs> discussed. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, yes, absolutely. My first thought was that the guy who represented the side of theater ideas was portrayed by a madman. We have that out of the way. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, at some point in like his sort of twisted weird way um mole says something about you use theater to state ideas so that theater makes a statement um theater makes a statement when it becomes or it can make a statement when it becomes self-aware and asks questions about but about itself so even the fact that they included or no cow included this in the play states that i mean um it can exist like theater can exist in both realms as we discussed. Um, so that's, there's that thought about, you know, it's becoming self-aware. So it, it already has that kind of notion of um, theater of ideas because it, it asks questions about itself, but it's also like Moll said that it becomes commercial theater when it, it exists purely to make money. Um, and you're using Calvin Klein in a play in as star power does that make sense so yeah you know what i mean so like it it can definitely exist in both realms and it it can be one side or the other or it can meld to make a beautiful production i mean like as creators all theater comes from ideas and comes from thoughts and and feelings and if if it didn't then it would just be like people standing on stage doing in the dark doing <laughs> nothing you know without like ideas beckett there play. Be anything. which but beckett plays are also like you're describing a beckett play but beckett plays are chock full of ideas like even exactly. that like it, it's you'd be it's, it's a challenge a yeah. ton of ideas it, it's yeah. a challenge to write something completely void of ideas and i kind of think coward wanted this play to almost be that in defense mm-hmm. of you know, no ideas is a okay in my books, but even that, there's still little ideas in there. They they don't necessarily cohere into something profound, but yeah, it's very hard to just have no ideas. It's like saying, don't think about anything. Damn it, I'm thinking about zebras. I don't know why I'm thinking about zebras, but you told me not to think about anything, so zebras. Damn those head. zebras. Saying not to think about anything still allows you to think about things because then you go off and start thinking about your own things. But like, mm-hmm. but <laughs> sorry, that was a really weird statement. But like, <laughs> in the example of like Samuel Beckett plays, those are still terrifying. Even if like dude is just sitting in a chair on stage surrounded by garbage or in a garbage can and he's not doing anything, like that's terrifying. <laughs> it still gives you thoughts and feelings, right? Even if the actors themselves aren't doing anything. And I would argue that like with Beckett, a lot of his ideas, the feelings he's exploring are alienation. Like they're dark, like dark subject matter. And I think it's not really much a question of does theater have ideas? Like it's kind of like a bit of a misnomer. It's are those ideas worth anything? Do they reflect the human experience? And we're, that kind of dives into the whole hierarchy of What's a good idea? But someone somewhere has to deem that idea worthy and worthy of somebody paying a ticket to get a bum in a seat or worthy as a piece of art to be to for like literally for actors and directors and people to be like, oh, this is I, I want to put time into this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think it's it, it's more like what is the idea and the populist idea mm-hmm. of like what no with present laughter. It's like, well. What are you what are you saying that's so important? Why why are we even here? And if it's just to laugh and to do a farce, if there's nothing underneath that, then like what's the point? Mm-hmm. So it, yeah. It, it's more what is the idea. Mm-hmm. You know, for a play called Present Laughter, it doesn't even seem to be making the point that laughter is good for its own sake. 
the characters don't even seem to be having a good time. Mm-hmm. Like the actors maybe are, I hope, but like <laughs> it's not about, you know, reinvigorating the joy of laughter. And you know what? Gary was right because he makes so many people laugh with his work. Like it's not even about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if it's not going to say the that, title mean, that should have been another question, but <laughs> we are getting to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we have any more thoughts about this last uh, uh, question, uh, I would say it is time for us to chuckle our way on home and give our sign-offs, you know? Uh, Talia, you can start us tonight. What is your sign-off? Do you have any socials you want to plug? Where can people find and follow you? Um, Okay. I've never done this before. Plug my socials. Mm -hmm. Um, So my name is Talia Rivers. You can follow me on Instagram at talia.rivers. Um, you, I also have an art account that please go follow if you like mm-hmm. art and pretty things or hopefully pretty things um, at rivers of paint. And um, does your cat have a, have my a cat does you? have an Instagram. Listen guys. So her, her Instagram is at Anya. So a N W a dot grand duchess. Um, Cause she's yeah. named that. Anastasia 1997 classic and she's you know granddad she's from Russia so those are my plugs thank you for having me it was a great time oh, oh thank you Megan where can people find and follow you and maybe read some of your work uh, well I'm a bit of a dinosaur I'm not active on social media though I do have Instagram if you want to see pictures not of me but of weird stuff it's McGovlet I don't I recently made it it was it was quick um i i wrote for the blank page for two years Mm -hmm. it's a uh, youth platform it's now debunked i think but you can find some of my writing fiction and article articles there um Mm -hmm. and thank you so much for having me this was a great conversation and it was it was really nice to be included on the panel thank you no it was our pleasure to have you you brought some fantastic points both of you did it was a true treat Ryan, give us that classic Ryan Barakovich send-off. I'm also not active on social media, so don't even bother trying to find me. Um, no, but you could just send all that love to Cup of Hemlock Theater. The Cup, hey, that's the show you're watching right now. Like, share, and subscribe. And, you know, literally everything I post on the one social media I, I am on is just sharing these episodes when they come out. So you're not missing much by not following me. Fair, fair enough. Uh, you can find and follow me uh, at our social media platforms at Mackenzie Horner. Just look for the ginger haired photo. And that's me. Uh, you can find and uh, follow my podcast before the downbeat uh, at before the downbeat, uh, where we talk all about musicals. We have yet to talk about Les Mis. That will be our season eight 100th episode. That is what we committed to. We are currently in the midst of doing season three. So we have some ways to go, but if you want to tune in now, you can hear some inklings of what uh, our lame is thoughts are. Uh, but other than that, like we just released our episode about Man of the Mancha, another madman, another artist who writes ideas and concepts and themes really well. So Miguel de Cervantes, uh, Tilting at Windmills, you know, that classic. Well, Cervantes wasn't a madman. Let's be clear about this. True. John Quixote <laughs> is the madman. <laughs> or is he mad though? That's the question. To each his Dulcinea, as, as he's they say. In mad. The <laughs> I don't know. I think he's very chivalrous and just kind of gets wrapped up. In I don't his know. Chivalry. I'm not overly familiar with the musical. I've read the book, and yeah, he's pretty mad. <laughs> it's a good musical. We can talk about that another time. <laughs> After we finish debating Les Mis. <laughs> Either way, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, watch all our latest episodes of the Cup Reviews right here on YouTube. Uh, you can also check out uh, uh, what will be coming up is a really fun mini series that Ryan and I are currently working on getting ready to release to all of you. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but in the meantime, oh, everybody, before we go, should we oh. plug the sonnets? Oh my goodness, Ryan, this is why you're here as my co-producer. <laughs> uh, plug away. Cup of Havelock Theater is doing a big, ambitious project that's way out of our depth, so we need your help. Uh, We want to record all 154 of Shakespeare's sonnets, but we don't want to make it easy for ourselves, so we want to have 154 different people 
each read one of them, and they will be released weekly on this YouTube channel once we kind of have a reasonable number of them. And it's taken a while, so if you want to go down to the link in the description, you, yes you, random stranger watching this, can sign up for a sonnet. The instructions are very simple. <laughs> You, all you have to do is sign up, you'll record yourself, you'll say a few words about why theater is important to you personally, your own relationship to the arts, and then you, yes you, can be the star of the show. But also, like well most said. of the sonnets are all about why a young man should procreate, so if that's your jam, you know, <laughs> get to the link in the description. You know, there's plenty, plenty still to choose from. Very true. Very true. Well, on that note, everybody... Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it's been a pleasure having Megan and Talia with us tonight. Ryan, always a pleasure. Everybody stay healthy. It's always stay a pleasure safe. to have you, Mac. Oh, be Perhaps still my heart. I'm hardly present. breathing. Perhaps the real present laughter is the friends we made along the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> and on that note, everybody, raise a glass. Thank you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and talk to you all very soon. Bye!